Hey, everybody. Thank you for listening to another episode of Church Leadership Lab, where our goal is to have conversations that empower healthy churches. We appreciate you taking some time today uh, to listen in. Uh, my name's Scott, one of your hosts, and Casey is our other host. How are you, Casey? You know, I'm good. I, I've good. I always want to say like... Yeah. I know there was, there was a question. A question. Mark. You started there with a question mark. I'm good. I didn't. I didn't mean to. I didn't mean to. I don't. I don't talk a lot about personal stuff very often. But uh, tomorrow, my two daughters go to summer camp. Okay. The older one has gone for six years in a row. Um, it's seven weeks, like out of state, overnight camp. Camp. This is not seven like weeks. Did I say weeks? I meant days. Maybe I was oh. hoping for seven weeks. I'm like, I meant That's days. Next I'm level. so sorry. I think yeah. I meant a full week and seven days, and then my brain did what, what you know, the sandwich of words. Seven okay. days. I'm sorry. Long story long, it's my younger daughter's very first time. Yeah. Like she's never even had a sleepover away from my grandparent, like aside from my grandparents. So this is like taking her out of state, dropping her off, and being like, good luck, everyone. Yeah. <laughs> like, wow. But that's um, tomorrow. So like in my brain, I'm listening to you, but I'm also like going through the packing list and all the yeah, things. Yeah. Yeah. So it's ben, good. Ben, you have, you have two daughters, right? I do a eight year old and a 10 year old. And the same thing, we're sending one of them off to camp, sleepover camp for the first time. So it's a little bit of trepidation yeah. and then yeah. also excitement for the parents to that's have right. a little bit of a break. So we're just, we're looking to extend those seven days into seven weeks as well. I I'm, did not I'm, mean I'm, that, but like, Hey, maybe I'm picking that up. There's a baby step program from seven yeah. days to weeks. So I'm with so, you. So while this is not the topic of this episode, I too is now. <laughs> am sending uh, our kids away for a week for summer camp. First time, 13 and 11. Um, and uh, they leave on Monday. So that's, uh, yeah. We can, so maybe, we can maybe all... part two will be our recap of how summer camp went. <laughs> Well, we should check back in with each other the middle of next week when our yeah. homes are quiet and we're like, what is happening right now? Yeah. Never know. Oh, man. That's awesome. Well, um, while we would love to talk about summer camp and parenting, we are not. Uh, we <laughs> are going to dive into uh, all things uh, creativity, communication, um, digital presence, all of that. And we're super excited to have um, Ben Stapley on with us. Uh, for over 20 years, uh, Ben has created, captured, moving, memorable moments for individuals, nonprofits, uh, co and corporations across the globe. Uh, he's worked in a number of areas from pastoring, preaching, speaking, uh, as well as uh, creative arts, videography, photography, blogging, reporting, producing all of it, uh, crafting worship services. And uh, he also consults for churches, speaks nationally at conferences about leadership, communication, creativity. And currently uh, he serves as the executive pastor at the Life Christian Church in West Orange, New Jersey, where he and his wife Rose uh, live with their two daughters about to go to summer camp, Violet and Scarlett. Uh, ben, <laughs> thanks so much for, for coming on the show. Thanks for having me on here. I've, I've listened to a number of your podcasts. I, and we said this off mic, but it's helpful to say on mic as well. I love how you are helping yeah. church leaders. I love your unique approach to the questions you ask. And I love that you're really focusing on health. I think the, the, yeah. the word of the year in 2020, 2021 was pivot. And I think the year, the word of the year for 2022 and 2023 has been health in a yeah. lot of different ways. So I love that you guys are pushing into that. It's awesome. And I'll, also, I'll Venmo you the 20 bucks for that incredible intro. Thank you for that. I'll yep. hit you up on the side. Thank you. I'll make sure to you make bet. it a, a private transaction so people can't uh, go back and see the record for that. <laughs> <laughs> well, one thing that we ask everybody uh, who comes on the show, Ben, is that there's, there's obviously the public bio that has um, everything there, but there's always something or a few things that doesn't make the public bio, but all your friends and family know this about you. They would, they would say this about you. So what, what is that for you? I like to engage. I, I like to, not just I do it. I like to engage with service workers. I love to say something, brighten up their day, uh, gas station attendant, grocery checkout person, someone working in the service industry um, for a couple of reasons. But that, that's a thrill. Sometimes my wife, after interacting with the, the person, you know, the barista, she's like, I think you like them more than you like me. So, so I have to <laughs> tamp it down a bit. But um, a couple of things. I'm always looking at life in terms of uh, cost-benefit analysis, right? Uh, inputs and outputs. What's, what's, what am I going to get for the ROI here? And there's nothing higher in terms of giving a small input 
for a service worker and then the output of their gratitude, there's nothing larger in life when it comes to that. So just yeah. a, a small engagement with them, even my bad dad jokes, you know, working hard or hardly working. Even that, that's lays, that's lays with service workers <laughs> classic. because they're bored out of the gourd. <laughs> yes. Yeah. That's a classic. I'm, I'm curious though, has that like, did you spend time working, you know, whether it was retail or food service or anything like that? <laughs> You're ahead of the curve on that, Scott. Yeah. So like, why do you, yes, because I, um, in grade nine, I always got, uh, sorry, starting grade nine, all the way through high school, all the way through mm -hmm. college, I did some type of service work in the summers to to try to get my first car and pay for college and et cetera, et cetera. So I'm yeah. used to on the receiving end of that, of this transaction sucks. Humanity is terrible. Uh, <laughs> can I, can we just all stop and like do a hard reset? You know? So, uh, yeah. so yes, I've been on the receiving end of that where this person smiled at me. That was nice of them. Yeah. So it's, it, again, this takes a little bit to, to make that blo blossom. Yeah. I, I worked at Starbucks for about eight years and, um, and worked in a, a very affluent area. And mm -hmm. I have never seen a human being get more angry than when y they ask for no foam on their latte and there's a little <laughs> bit of foam on there. Uh, it, Just a it little. Was remarkable. <laughs> yes, entitlement goes through the roof uh, uh, when you're paying nine dollars for a for a latte. Yes, it does. Yeah, yeah, which which, which I get, but yeah, I'm, I, I'm with you. And and there's when you have spent time working there, you do have a, some appreciation in a in maybe a different way because you're like, I was you when I was 16, and I get it. <laughs> I, I remember that. Yeah. And you know, there's, there's a range of people and I, you know, I'll also look for, for spiritual opportunities as well, where, yeah. you know, sometimes, you know, and it's, and probably half the times I get a no, but you know, where, where you can see someone's really having a hard time and it's uh, hey, do you, would you like me to pray for you? Sometimes mm. it's no, and sometimes it's yes, <laughs> but there's, there's, I even look for, for those inroads as, as well. If not, if I'm just working on my dad joke game for my kids, if, if that alone, <laughs> it's worth it. Yeah. When I am a firm, I've said this so many times recently, and you are, you are validating my inner feelings that every adult human being should re be required to work minimum, I would say one season in either food service or retail. And by season, mm -hmm. like if you have not worked Christmas in retail, oh. you are not a Ooh. fully formed adult human being where you Ooh. do not yet have the qualifications to be a good polite, patient, kind human. <laughs> like, it seems like we've all had that experience. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. That's like the, the Christmas season retail, like there's Dante's night in circles. I think that that's the 10th one right there. Yeah, I don't know. That's, there. that's pretty intense. <laughs> I've been there. I, I will very, very, very short story. I did work retail and there is still to this day, a song that was on our Christmas playlist in the store that I worked in. And I won't say the name of it, of the store or the song. When I hear it, this little, like I get heart palpitations. I feel nauseous. Yeah. I'm like, I'm folding jeans and t-shirts again. And like, I have to leave wherever I am. Like, so there's like, All right. there's some PTSD, we, but. Casey, I said I worked at Starbucks though. So what, what was the store? Well, there, there were a couple, Scott, but um, I, I was a regional manager for the buckle. Oh, amazing. Is, I like that. Okay. The buckle I've never heard. <gasps> well, well, I don't know yeah, if it's, it's everywhere. It's in it's in most shopping malls, and it is just a lot of denim. <laughs> Hence why you a have, lot yeah. of skews, a lot of ripped jeans that cost like one hundred ninety dollars, and so, okay, yeah, yeah. yeah. This okay. episode's brought to you actually by the buckle. Um, we, no. <laughs> Ten percent off if you use my <laughs> discount, discount code. code. I probably still have, have some old punch cards in like an old wallet from my go. 16 year old purse or so. I don't know. We'll, nice. we'll, we'll sidebar this later, but right. Ben, I am somehow going to bring this back to our topic at hand. <laughs> These watch this. I'm going to do a good job. Service industry, right? Day in and day out church working sometimes every week, right? Every week is a grind. If you worked on staff at a church, you are always just prepping for Sunday, prepping for Sunday, prepping for Sunday. Not a lot of time to maybe breathe, to think about being engaging about your communication because you got to get a job to do, right? You just got to prepare for the Sunday weekend service. But all of your years of experience in communication and all things engagement, dad jokes included, how can a church leader keep services fresh? How can you keep it engaging and make sure that it's not just prepping for Sunday, part of the grind. Casey, I appreciate that masterful transition. I, my Thanks. mind's eye saw you traveling on a Segway right there. It was so masterful. But <laughs> I wouldn't go that far, but <laughs> I'm going to bring us back stretch. on track one way or the other. 
<laughs> the uh, man, there's yeah. So how do you do that? How do you stay fresh, especially yeah. if your job is in relationship to Sunday experiences, services, your gatherings, whatever you guys call mm-hmm. them? That can be a challenge. There's a couple of things that I've learned over the years through trial and error, a lot of error. Mm-hmm. Um, but the one, the couple of takeaways I would have for that is the one is I'd encourage you not to try to one up yourself. Uh, mm-hmm. Oftentimes we try to, especially coming out of holiday seasons, man, that was, that was a blast. That was incredible. We need to do that again and again and yeah. again. Mm-hmm. And we don't necessarily need to one up ourselves. Um, and even, I think there's a beauty and there's a profoundness on relying on the spirit and, and, and not out of laziness or sloth. Mm-hmm. Um, you can look through Proverbs and there's a value of hard work. And I don't think most Christians, I don't think most Christians underwork. I think mm-hmm. more Christians on the end there in this spectrum have a Messiah complex. And they think it's mm-hmm. all on them. And unless mm-hmm. we we got a banger in terms of a worship set and we got a killer bumper video and uh, someone zip lining somewhere at some point, <laughs> this service is not going to glorify God. Yeah. And, 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 and on the inverse mm-hmm. where I'm saying, you know what, we, we've done our best uh, and we're going to step back and see how God fills in the rest. I mm-hmm. think there's something supernatural, something super uh, powerful that I think there's a reliance that we demonstrate. And so not only not one upping yourself, but demonstrating a reliance on God mm-hmm. um, a number of times throughout your calendar year is saying we, we've only been able to do this much and that's okay. Uh, God's going to do the rest. That's mm-hmm. one one encouragement I give towards people. Another a quick encouragement I give towards people is I like to encourage you with a Sabbath when it comes to your reviews. Mm. An axiom I like to use is if it's good enough to do, it's good enough to review. So you mm. do your service, you do your gatherings. Do you do a debrief, an autopsy, a review? Do you do that? And most churches do this. I'm not talking about this isn't new for a lot of people. If you're not, I would encourage you to do that. A quick checklist for that is what worked, what didn't, uh, what needs to be added, what needs to be subtracted. Let's review our on-site and our online services if we have them. Um, but so so you do that. The problem is when I've been doing this now, again, for like 20 years, I have found that for myself and the teams I lead, if you don't give yourself a Sabbath, if you don't give yourself a break from that review, it just feels like every Monday morning you're coming to the table and saying, yep, the pro presenter operator was slow on slides again. Yeah. And, <laughs> yeah. and it can just be really – um, discouraging and it feels like a weight. And how do you take the weight off? Lift that weight. And so mm-hmm. a number of times I try to aim for every four, six, eight weeks, we're not going to review Sunday. Mm-hmm. Some things were missed. We understand that. Um, but we're not going to review it because mm-hmm. I'm going to, I'm going to lighten your load. Uh, Jesus is yoke and is, is, is light. And, um, and how do I do that with my staff and my volunteers? Mm-hmm. That's one of the ways in which I do that just to give them a break from reviewing things again and again, and again, it helps them stay fresh. Mm. And, then uh, and then Paul, yeah. Um, uh, the other thing in terms of staying fresh too is probably a, an R and D. So where do I give myself, my staff, my volunteers a chance to do some research and design? Where do they, where do they get a chance to experiment and to play and to try new things? Um, mm-hmm. Or do I just, is it again and again, you have to make it perfect every time. That's, mm-hmm. that's probably the third thing I, I would do for bringing creativity and the freshness for myself and others, giving them that margin to play around in the work week and to, to try some things, even if they don't work out. Yeah. I love that you mentioned that the one up in yourself, that's, that's kind of like, it's pretty powerful. I don't remember if we've talked about it on the show or not. I, I know it's a conversation I've had that if every weekend experience is the zip line and the, the local marching band and the fireworks and the free hot dogs, what happens when someone comes back and it's suddenly not that it's just very like, Oh, well, well, last week you had a circus and then now there's nothing. And it's like <laughs> that, it's that push and pull of like, you can have a giant event, but if every single week is all about the experience, then is it ever just about the, the presence of God? Is it about our worship service? Is it just about the things that we try to do to get people in the door? And I think we lose sight of that with, with good intention. It's not like we come into that planning session, like, how can we forget about Jesus? <laughs> like, right, right. How, you know, I don't think we do that intentionally, but when it's that every week you're, you're, you don't realize it, but you're one upping yourself. That's pretty powerful. I like Casey, that you led uh, with that. Casey, let me ask you this question. Let me, let me turn the table here. So oh, I've yeah. heard some people use the, we don't even want to go big on our Christmas or Easter's because yeah. it feels like it's a bait and switch for yeah. our new guests here. And if they come back, it's now I, I think I would, I would counter that, but I'd love mm-hmm. to know your take on that. Do you're like, no, 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 
the, um, whatever you do, do your standard, even on your big holiday services? No, I think that's a really good question. And you are the first person who has ever said hot seat turn around. Um, <laughs> I, I think, I, I don't know why you picked me and not Scott, but that's fine. Um, I, uh, was, I led worship at a, one of the largest churches in America for 15 years. And we did some pretty big stuff, but with intention. So I think there was a lot of healthy balance where the weekend experience was all, it was always consistent. And then a few times a year, there was a pretty big, you know, we, there was more of an emphasis as I think it should be like, we're going to celebrate Christmas because that's kind of what it's all about as a Christian. Hey, Easter, it's kind of a like core piece of our faith. So why not celebrate that yeah. to your point though, if there are not pieces in that to, in my opinion, this is just opinion of Casey to recognize the first timer and then connect them to here's what you can expect when you come back. Mm. Or if you don't have a church home, here's the normal parts that you can absolutely expect next week isn't going to be the circus because next week is January. It's not Christmas anymore, but we can't wait to see you again. And the, the consistency parts that also takes careful planning, but I, I like a little bit of circus, but when it really kind of, it's a moment of celebrating. I like celebrating my birthday. Mm. I'm not going to stop mm. celebrating that, but every That's day. That's a unique day birthday. of of the year. And yeah. If, yeah, if I don't give my wife flowers on Mother's Day, it's like, well, this is just a regular day. There's other, you know, like right. that's not going to fly in our household yeah. like right now. So to yeah. the same degree, when are we saying, hey, man, like, how do we, how do we really, man, how do we celebrate the resurrection of Jesus? And if this is special, and you know, maybe it's not pyrotechnics, but yeah. maybe it's something a little different. Yeah, yeah, we can celebrate without creating hype just for the sake of mm. hype. That's but it's nice a celebration, contrast. you know, so I like to celebrate. I, I, I kind of think about, you brought up like the birthday analogy. So if you think about meals and what you eat, there's like all of us have our kind of taste profiles, right? Like for me, not a huge fish guy. I'm not, I'm not sitting down with a lot of joy to like a filet <laughs> of halibut or whatever, right? So like, so I kind of have, this is, this is me. This is kind of what I do food wise. Now on my birthday, I'm probably going to like a nice meal, you know, whether that's deep dish pizza, which is coincidentally the greatest pizza in the world, um, or like whatever, whatever that is, right. I'm staying within the spectrum of who I am, but it, it might be on the, the nicer end or the like we're putting a little more effort or resource mm -hmm. into that um but i'm staying in the spectrum of who i am versus mm -hmm. hey let's go have you know oysters and sushi in which uh, that would not be much of a celebration so same a <laughs> church that has a spectrum of like this this is this is who we are right mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. we never have pyrotechnics but you know, on Christmas, you bring your, you know, fire extinguishers because we're going nuts. Like that's outside of the spectrum of, of who you are. And then it's, it's whiplash when people come back and that that's mm. the opposite. So I kind of think like staying too within that, understanding what that is, staying within that, but knowing we're going to give it a little more resource and attention on these kind of special days. Scott, first of all, you outed yourself as a food uh, as a foodie by saying your 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 taste palate. I've never heard that phrase before. But first of all, and then second <laughs> of all, being just being outside of New York, I don't know if I can confirm that the deep dish is the best style of pizza, unless you want your months of dairy intake with one <laughs> slice, because there's oh. so much cheese. Yes, I did not I did not say it was the best for your health because that's definitely not the case. <laughs> <laughs> but we've I've had this conversation before. We can we, I can always agree to disagree. Uh, no hate on New York pizza. I just know the correct place that it falls. So. Okay. Oh boy. Okay. <laughs> well, I, I, I'm curious. You know, we're we're talking about I think some of these things that um, you know that that avoid mm -hmm. that that grind. And I know that especially if you are in a context where maybe you have a smaller team or all volunteer team, mm -hmm. it's not that the grind doesn't exist in in a church with a large team, it does, but sometimes it can be, it can feel a little bit different. And so what are ways, especially for smaller churches, smaller teams, maybe all volunteer teams where they can inject some of that creativity into their gatherings, into their services, um, and specifically maybe some things that might be simple and not require tons of budget, you know, more team, but that a lot of people, you know, could apply and do. Great question. Before even the the what, I would encourage 
your listeners to think about where first. So in other words, there are a number of opportunities for you to inject creativity in places where it's safe to do it, where you can, I always use the analogy on Christmas and Easter, you better step up to the plate and hit a grand slam. Um, Don't, you know, don't swing and miss, but there's sometimes when you can swing and miss and where are those um, opportunities, two great opportunities. First of all, staff meetings. If you, you know, um, I, I don't like clowns. I was traumatized by clowns as a child. But if you brought clowns into a staff meeting, no harm, no foul, right? Okay, it yeah. didn't work out. That was just a bizarre experience. We're <laughs> not going to do that on Sunday. Uh, you, you know, Youth retreats are another great environment. And the reason I encourage people to think through environments first, because oftentimes we think our creativity is going to come. I, I'm going to give you right now on this podcast the five most creative things that you can do in this but it's really going to come from you experimenting because of who you are what your context is who your people are and so you need safe space to do that to try some things you you, your best ideas come from terrible ideas and so where can you do that first of all encourage people to do that and then now the how um some ways in which you can do that first of all worship is a big component of a lot of our experiences and encourage you to think through what does that look like for you to do that and a lot of – again, we'll start with a kind of low-hanging fruit for our listeners, maybe ramp up a little bit here. But one of the things I encourage is, is there ways that you can make your worship a little more interactive? So mm. obviously, we're, you know, your band's playing and people are singing with it. Are there other ways to do that? I was at a church once where the – we had like a, a drummer uh, who was one of our worship leaders. And it, like, every th- song was like percussion-led. Mm. And they wanted to do something where they had somebody in the, in the, in the congregation that taught school. And like we started, they started brainstorming. They said, you know those little egg shakers? They're like, yeah. They're like, do you have a lot of those at school? The person's like, yeah. It's like, I have 500 of them. He's like, perfect. He's like, bring them in on Sunday. And then as everybody comes in, we're going to give an egg shaker to everybody who comes in on Sunday morning. And then uh, we're going to have percussion led worship. So it's not just me on the kick. Like you guys are all going to shake along with it. Yeah. It was a train wreck. It was a it was a glorious, glorious train wreck. So if you're not aware, unless you are like a studio drummer, most people don't play to the beat. Yes. All of our natural tendencies. I'm not a worship person. I'm just told these things. Yeah. We want to speed things up. So the BPMs of the songs like started at the 90, and I think we were like 130 by the end. Everyone was out of breath. Yeah. The 20 yeah. minute worship set took like 12 minutes. It was yeah. it was it was terrible. And so no lie. So that no, was yeah. No lie. I so I'm I'm by voc- I'm by vocation. I work at, as a worship pastor at my church right now. Last Sunday, we're doing a song, and I and I can tell people are trying to clap, but they're just like, I, w- when do when do I do it? I don't I don't know. And I literally stopped the song. I was like, all right, everybody, let's get on the same page. This is when you clap. Here's the beat. You clap here. You move your hands. So all to say, I confirm that large groups don't have rhythm. In the <laughs> middle, as soon as you said egg shakers. I could see Scott's thought bubble because he and I are both the, our, our background is worship. And I was like, Oh no, this did not, this did, this story is not going to end well. But <laughs> I would also love to know if they ask that teacher, do you have recorders? How many recorders do you have? Yeah. Oh. That's the only way that story could have gone worse. Yeah. Anyway, the, the experimentation, I think, is what you were was is what yes. you were, you're saying. Yes, experiment. A Look for, for non traditional things. A for yeah. effort. We once I was at a church once, and we had a tambourine lady. In other words, uh, she would always sneak in a tambour tambourine, and she would and she would sit in different places in the worship yes. place, and you just hear that thing. She'd just pull it out of her purse and she'd start rocking it. And we'd always have like secure, like pat her down, like do you have a tambourine on you today? You cannot bring yeah, it in. Yeah. We've talked Care about this, Miss Jones. You cannot bring it into the worship environment. <laughs> How many times are we going to have to tell you, Linda? You yeah. can't do it. Uh, so, so you know, uh, ex- experimental worship, interactive worship, some basic stuff. I remember like the, um, working with a younger worship team that were all very new t- uh, to Christianity. And we were doing, uh, we were pretty modern worship style. And we were bringing a number of hymns and we were, we were performing them. And they were like, I don't know what this is, but I like it. Mm-hmm. And some of the things growing up in a church – and coming from a traditional background, some of the things I just knew and were in my context, I didn't realize everybody didn't know. And so, mm. like, you don't know the backstory behind Amazing Grace? Like, I've heard this a thousand yeah. times. You've never heard this? Well, it's pretty awesome. Mm. Even though I've heard it a thousand times, let's share it again. And so, especially with yeah. songs that have a rich tradition or backstory mm. behind it, you're, you know, the old adage is you're, you're preaching to a parade. People are coming and they're going. You have mm-hmm. new people to the faith. Give that background. Um, especially if you're the worship leader and you're like, I, yeah, this is played out. It's played out for you, but it's not mm-hmm. played out for your audience, especially a core portion if new people are coming in. Hopefully yeah. they are. Um, give that to them as well. And then the other thing too is I would encourage um, 
uh, even hiring unique performers as well. Hmm. I've done this, you know, other people, it's not new, but like, is there, are there services or there events that would work to hire in somebody with outside of your regular five piece band? Hmm. So, um, Maybe it's, you know, you're going to, um, it's Memorial Day and you're going to have someone, a bagpiper, uh, you know, perform a song. You're like, oh my goodness, that just kind of feels right or it's, it's different. It, it connects with us. I, I remember once, going back to my Chicago days, I was I was in the, um, the subway and I heard someone during the Christmas season playing O Come, O Come, Emmanuel mm-hmm. on trumpet. And mm-hmm. there's something to it. I always feel like the trumpet or any brass instrument kind of cries. It just has a soulfulness to it. Mm-hmm. And it is the, I was in there by myself and the sound was just reverberating down the subway. And uh, it was like it was a cheap college student, so I didn't have much money. I just had a wallet of singles. But I just kept on giving them single after single. Yes. And it's like, can you play it again? Can you play it again? Mm. Because that idea that, you know, often you sing that triumphantly. But like, no, there's this there's this mourning. There's this, yeah. man, yeah. Can Emmanuel, just come with us and be with us. And it's like, man, we have to, we have to, we don't have anyone in our congregation who can play trumpet, but it's like, gosh, darn it. I'm going to hire somebody mm-hmm. and I want to recreate that experience for our whole people as we're anticipating Christmas yeah. and we're asking for Emmanuel to come be with us again. Um, how do we, how do we hearken back to that? Um, uh, as the Israelites were anticipating and waiting for that and what's the right instrument to, to, to play it. It's not our five piece band. And it's and, and I'm not going to hire my nephew in the congregation who can play it. Uh, but he's going to he's going to do a crap job at it. I yeah. need to hire a professional to do it right. It comes yeah. back to the nephew. It all there's always a nephew, right? It's always the nephew who can do it. Yes, but okay. hire hire a professional to do yeah. it right. Yeah. I don't know if this is the part where there will be a graphic overlay, but I wrote down something that you said that I'm going to remember for a minute. Um, the best ideas come from terrible ideas, hmm. and like that's really really good. Um, for me, that doesn't give me license just to have a bunch of half-baked crappy ideas, but it does give me permission to experiment and mm-hmm. think a little bit differently. So I I love that you said that. Um, there, go there, ahead. Just to p- piggyback on that, there uh, another great quote, and it ties into that. The post-laureate, I think in the early 2000s was asked, I was listening to an NPR interview with him and they asked, when did you write your, like, when did, when did you write your first poem mm-hmm. that you were proud of? And they said, it took me 200 bad poems to finally get yeah. to mm-hmm. one good poem and yeah. they likened it to most artistic endeavors they said whatever your art is you every po- poem writer has 200 bad poems in them yeah. they just got to write them and get them out and finally get to that good one so a songwriter yeah. a videographer a photographer you know photographer it's, it's more than 200 you probably got 2,000 photos of you taking a photo of your friend's feet with you sitting in a circle and like a selfie in front of you in front of the mirror and like yeah. there's just all these bad photos you're going to take i know it take them <laughs> and mm-hmm. then get to the good one but you again you only get to that good stuff by getting through the bad stuff yeah I'm uh, um, I've done a lot, a lot of songwriting over the years, and I've explained it to other songwriters who are maybe starting out. Like it's like a staircase. So if I'm <laughs> down here and I'm trying to get up, you know, up here or up to a higher place, if you're if you're listening to this and not watching, you have to build a staircase. But you only do that like you can only do it one step at a time. And in order to get there, like you have to build those stairs. And so some some songs or whatever the creative endeavor is, like. The purpose is it's, it's another stair. And so, you you know, and some of them might hit a little bit different and you never know, but it's, if you can just focus on that act of I'm just building stairs, then eventually you're in a different spot than, than where you started. Scott, do you, do you that's a, I love that analogy. I'm gonna, it's down my back pocket. I'm going to keep yeah. it there. I'm going to pull it out later on. Do you see a stair that most artists get stuck on in terms of that staircase well, that they yeah. just got to push on through? I, honestly, I, here's what I think they get stuck on is the quality of the stair. So the, 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 they start and it's like, why, why isn't this like the person who's been to stay with the analogy building Mm. stairs for years? Right. Mm. I, 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 I tried it. I did it. It doesn't look the same. I probably can't do it. Mm. And that, and so it's more a, the, the, the quality and, and sometimes too, people can't, their skill doesn't match their vision. And so Mm -hmm. they are doing something in which they know is not what they want to do, but that skill has not caught up yet. And if you can't either one, understand that that's part of the process and that everybody does that and you just don't get to see it because that doesn't get published or whatever, or if they are just too discouraged um, Mm -hmm. and think it's never going to happen, like then you never press on and actually get to that point where your skill matches your vision. That's helpful. Again, this is, you know, it's a visual and audio medium, but there's that you're, 
when you start out, you don't know how bad you are. Yeah. But then through the journey, your understanding match, you know, catches up to you with poor quality. And you're like, I actually, I really stink. <laughs> yeah. And it's, I think, I think you're hitting on that. How do you push through that, that aha moment when you finally realize you're putting out mediocre art? Yeah. And how do you push through it? And that it's almost like a, yeah, I almost see like a line graph of, of charting your confidence to where mm. you start and you're going up and then you realize, and it actually sinks pretty down low. And it's only if you can get through that curve and keep going that I think then it actually goes up and that's where then you start to produce stuff that you might feel like, okay, this is more, you know, what I had in mind. So mm. I, I I'm curious about something cause we, we just talked about the, like that quote Casey that you had said, the best ideas come from, I'm going to botch it, but the best ideas basically come from the worst ideas. Um, uh, how have you – because you've, you've done a lot in creative environments and whether that's planning a service, writing an article, um, whether that – like whatever you're doing creative, it starts where you're brainstorming and thinking. And often, especially for church leaders who are planning worship services, most of the time that's done in a group setting with other people, hopefully. Um, so how have you fought against that tendency in brainstorming, in creativity within groups where it's like, oh, this will never work or this is kind of ridiculous or – and oftentimes people don't even say it. But like how, how do you kind of fight through that or even make space to say throw out literally any idea. Nobody's going to laugh at you or you know that sort of thing. Yeah, there's a, there's a couple of easy ways to create and foster that. The one is just because it's hitting me right now is um, the one thing I try to remind myself, and sometimes I'll even visualize and do it, is that it's it's sacred, it's holy ground, and I've you know I've done the thing. I'm going to take off my shoes and my socks, and maybe I haven't clipped my nails in a while, but it's okay yeah. because this is this is holy ground. Because oftentimes we treat our our performance as the holy ground, right? Mm-hmm. That's when the uh, spirit comes. It's five minutes before the countdown. Spirit show up. Yeah, um, pretty but pleased. The, the, yeah, please. please. <laughs> I haven't practiced. Would you please? Sure. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> no, that's on you, bro. Yeah. Um, the but the spirit's presence is with you as much during your performance as he is with your practice. As the spirit is with your preparation and your planning. Mm-hmm. Even this conversation right now feels hallowed to me. And so, reminding your ideators that that there's something special, supernatural, spiritual, God infused right now. We're not just you know, pulling out the coolest ideas from a mega church right now and trying to copy them. There's something different. And the spirit wants to say that to us. And are we receptive? And we're going to hear it. And I'm sure you guys have been in those meetings too, where someone's like, I think we should do this. And everyone's just like, you know, the kind of the, the, the record scratch happens and then the, and I'm like, that is that, that was from God. There's no other place that that was from. And, and I'm like, yeah. yes, that is what we need to do. And so like re- reminding them on that is really helpful to, to infuse that the spirituality um, sometimes I do something very basic. It's not very su- spiritual, but it's very practical. And I'll throw out a bunch of terrible ideas to begin with, especially if you have mm-hmm. yet younger people or if there's a power imbalance, like you're the one leading the meeting and you've been doing it for a while. And like you yep. seem like you have all the ideas. Then I like to, I like to start and this again, um, not that clown professions are terrible, but like, what'd you say clowns? Everyone's like, yeah, that's, that's a terrible idea. Yeah. <laughs> Unless you're at the circus, that's a terrible idea. So I'll, I'll throw out, I got a couple in my back pocket. I pull out all the time. Like, I think we should do this. And it diffuses the tension yeah. in the room. Yeah. And people who are sitting on ideas, like, I don't want to be embarrassed by bringing this up. Is it, it's probably a stinker. It, it creates that foster, uh, fosters that attitude. And then I'll use the old improv um, analogy as well of yes. And so when someone brings <laughs> an idea to the table, you just like an imp- improv, someone's like, I got a gun. You're like, no, you don't. That's <laughs> like, you shut down the scene. Yeah. You say, yes, you have a gun. And guess what I have? I have a whip and we're going to do a scene here. So uh, obviously I was never gifted at improv. So you say, <laughs> you say yes. And then you add to the scene in relationship. Yeah. So when it brings an idea, you honor that by saying that is that is awesome. How can we build upon that? And that's even something I've seen a lot of a lot of brainstorming sessions don't maximize their the the, the juice in the room. They're like, mm-hmm. okay, good idea, good. Next, and like we'll yeah. just keep on going. But like, there's like ten people in the room, and we all have a thought on what was just said. And th- there, can we respond to that? And so yeah. even like giving yourself that response time to do the yes, that was awesome. But the and, can anyone build upon that? Let's yeah. see where that goes. I think those are some helpful hits. Like all of that combined is perfect with the staircase and getting through the junk. I'm going to age myself and just 
share a little bit of stuff that is not necessarily fit on the church leadership lab podcast, but I have loved Ben folds since mm-hmm. middle school. He's yeah. a genius musical writer, producer, composer. He has a whole talk about the Brown note that in songwriting, you have to, Scott, I don't know if you know, like your smile, though, I don't know if you, do you know this, but he's like, think about like an old um, set of pipes and water has to go through that. And if it's full of rust and clogs mm. and junks, you still just have to push through. So that first water that comes out is brown yeah. or fill in whatever other uh, less than hygienic analogy you want to think about the brown note, but you have to push through the junk and until you get through the bad ideas and be willing to throw out the first bad ideas. Cause to your, exactly to your point, I like think about I'm the intern in the room and I don't want to break mm-hmm. the silence and all the senior leaders go, you're dumb. <laughs> like, why are you here? Like maybe I can fall on my sword, throw out an intentional Brown note so that I can get the mm-hmm. creativity flowing, push through that, build the next stair. And then finally get to the aha. That was the great idea. But a, a bunch of junk has to filter through first. We have to be willing to be like, this one might suck, but I'm going to throw it out there anyway. <laughs> yeah. Ben, have you ever, uh, have you ever, or, or Casey, heard of the book Hatch by Mm-mm. C. McNair Wilson? No. So he, uh, he was a former Disney Imagineer and uh, worked on a ton of their theme park design, but it's all about brainstorming and mm. how to mm. brainstorm in a way. And so he, they, he talks about yes and, and, and has some stories mm. too. It's really interesting for those who love Disney. There's some stories too about how that led to like some of the iconic Disney rides like Splash mm. Mountain or, um, or Space Mountain or whatever. Um, but, but that, that in particular is something I was just thinking about. Cause I, th- I think I, I really like how we've kind of landed on some of this. What does it look like to be creative and to, involve a team and to, mm-hmm. um, you know, to, to come up with some of these ideas. And that's, that's something I'd recommend. It's a really good book. Ben, I am curious about this for you personally, again, because of your, um, experience, the amount of time that you've been just in leading creatives, being in, in creative fields yourself. And, and I even go to, I mean, a lot of just leadership involves creativity mm. as well, I mm-hmm. would say. Mm-hmm. Um, but how, what are some ways that you personally keep fresh, uh, creati- creatively? The great question, the way for, for myself, we live in a, we live, um, close to where my wife and I live between Philly and New York. So getting a chance to go to world-class cities, um, and see what's happening there. Again, if you're in the Midwest, that's, you know, Hey, that's awesome. And for the church leaders who are there, um, you know, utilize what you have, but that's for me is I'm, I'm trying to go to places that are cutting edge mm-hmm. and are, and then, and then inspire myself, um, by those people. I will, um, my, I like to curate my Vimeo feed. So people, and this is a little like, uh, geeky, but you can, you know, you follow different people on Vimeo and then they have like the, my feed. So you see the videos that they're putting out there. And the reason I like that is because Vimeo in contrast to YouTube is a little more artsy yeah. and people will put out stuff instead of just their cats. Um, <laughs> it'll be, you know, um, an abstract expression video based upon cats. And so it's, yeah. um, so I'd like to follow, I like to, it, it kind of curates the, it's a more curated pop platform and then you can curate it even more based upon who you're following. So I like to do that. Um, I like to, I have a 40 minute commute. And so I try to, I try to, the reason I I like to jump on podcasts is because it keeps me accountable. Like I'll say things like I do this as a leader. And then my staff's like, no, you don't do that. And so it really (laughs) helps me be accountable (laughs) to share what I try to do. I know my wife may listen to this and she'll like, so what I try to do on my, on my commutes is I try to, um, and not just like listen to podcasts all the time mm-hmm. and have in- inputs all the time. I try to have I try to have active and passive inputs. And what I mean by that is usually on the way in or the way out, I'll actively okay, this is the podcast I want to listen to. This is a book I want to consume. Um, but then on the back end, I try to take the earbuds out and have passive inputs. In other words, I'm going to think about a problem and I'm going to brainstorm a concept or I'm just going to envision and let my mind go wander mm. and I'm going to be passive. I have a really hard time with this mm. because oftentimes I'm just filling, filling my head with other people's thoughts, but mm. God's given me three plans of brain matter that he wants me to activate yep. that I oftentimes underutilize. And so I have to take the earbuds out and saying, okay, brain, what do you got for me? Yeah. And sometimes my brain's mm. like, 
we haven't talked in a while, not much. And, uh, but over time it, it fires back on. Yeah. And, and beyond that, I use the, I love, um, I take Ephesians three twenty very seriously that God wants to do more than we can think of or even mm-hmm. imagine, mm-hmm. which is, which is for creative. It's a beautiful verse. And so I like to have imaginary, imaginative conversations with God, um, with past uh, spiritual leaders, mm. uh, with future spiritual leaders, with the f- future version of myself, like mm. when I'm in my 60s and like, why didn't you take a flyer and try that? Yeah, I should have. And you, ha- you can have all these great imaginative conversations and you have no idea where it's going, which is yeah. always like really funny because it's like you think it's coming from somewhere, but it's just in here. You just need yeah. to give yourself a chance to have those conversations, which – Again, also, we're going to sidetrack here for a second. I know we're, we're talking about being parents. If you are struggling with your child, I like to talk to their future version of themselves. So mm-hmm. I talk to a 25-year-old version of them. I say, why weren't you – how could I not get you to focus when you were eight years old? What was wrong? Mm-hmm. And then, well, that actually – the problem I was having was I wasn't – you know, you were giving me all instruction. I just need to be hugged and loved more. And that would, and so, like, I have future mm-hmm. conversations with my daughters to help them out presently. You can do that from your theology. You can do that with your creativity. Mm. It's that's a really good thing. But beyond beyond how you do that, just take the inputs out, take the earbuds out, and yeah. allow yourself some passive thoughts. Yeah, it's really good. That is definitely not something I'm good at currently, and I'm going to add that to the notes I've feverishly written. I'm like, talk to myself more, <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah. but also listen. Mm-hmm. I love that idea. Um, well, Ben, I feel like we could have, um, a number of little trail off sidebar conversations and mostly just because you're sparking my creativity and I love this conversation, but everything that we try to do, every conversation we facilitate is to empower healthy churches. So one question that we love to ask everyone that comes on the show is to you, what is one essential component of a healthy church? I'm going to take this question and run with it. You said one, but I'm going to open it up a little bit bigger than that. Everyone always does. It's fine. They Nobody do. obeys the rules. Yeah. Yeah. It's an That's unwritten good. rule that you can do that. So, <laughs> <laughs> the, well, If I were to summarize it, one big thing is to review, to uh, assess, a- a- analyze, review the church, perceive the church, not based upon your your current needs, but someone else's future needs. Mm-hmm. What I mean by that is oftentimes we review the church for our current needs. Does that have a good youth program for my teenager? Mm-hmm. Am I going to like the message? Does my wife connect with the music? Those aren't bad, but they're all very secondary and they're all mm-hmm. very temporary. My kid's going to get out of youth group soon. Yeah. Um, my music style, taste is going to change. Mm-hmm. But whoever the lead communicator is, it doesn't matter who it is. After 40 messages, I'm going to get a little bored with their style and I need to push yeah. through that. Those are all temporary about myself. Don't assess a church about yourself and your temporary needs. Instead, mm-hmm. assess it whether or not they're trying to meet the needs of other people long term. In other words, are they trying to be outsider focused? Because guess what? Yeah. If you're a part of a church that is thinking about other people and how the and try to, try to live out Jesus' desire to draw all people onto himself, that he's not willing that any should perish. If that's the church's DNA and its core mission, you will always be satisfied there. You will always feel invigorated there. Again, yeah. When the worship style changes, it's okay because their mission is much bigger than you and your temporary needs. So that's that's the big thing I would encourage people to do. A couple like very practical ways to do it is to ask around the neighborhood, what do you think about the church down the road? I didn't know there was a church down the road. Uh-oh. I thought that was a synagogue, right? Like a little, yeah. oh. So a, 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 how is the church perceived in the neighborhood? Yeah. And then what goes out the door? Uh, again, not to get theological on us, but we're, we were being blessed to be a blessing to others. Mm-hmm. How much of the church's budget goes out the door? Hopefully it's five, 10, maybe even 15%, or is it all just internal? If so, there's a little, again, and I'm a church, I'm a, I'm a church leader, right? Someone can look at our budget seat and, you know, is it enough? I, I understand it's, it's never going to be enough, but is there, is there some degree of the church saying this isn't just about us? We've been blessed mm-hmm. to bless others. And how does that financially show up? Um, for our staff members who are, so that's the general congregate. For the staff member who's listening, I would ask the lead pastor is, you know, do you have a Nathan? So if, you, if you're King David, is there a prophet Nathan in your life? And if you don't mm-hmm. know that quick story, when David was caught in an affair with Bathsheba, um, the fro- prophet came up to him and said, I want to tell you a story about a guy who had 100 sheep. And, mm-hmm. and then Nathan goes to call him on the, on the carpet and is saying, um, you are that man. And David mm-hmm. was cut to the heart saying, you, you got me. Is there someone in your, in your lead pastors and hopefully your whole leadership mm-hmm. team where they can say, Hey man, that's not right. Yeah. Um, 
And I, I would encourage you to ask a couple things. That person shouldn't be their best friend from high school. Probably, <laughs> I would probably be here. That person probably shouldn't be on their on their on their board, and they see them once a year, but they live on the other coast of the country. Probably, it should probably be someone who sees them um, yeah. and engages with them actively, and where you could say, when's the last time they did that? And it's sometime within the decade. Um, <laughs> is it actually happening on a fairly regular basis? No one's perfect, and I and and I. I Lord knows, I do not need to know what that is. I should not know what that is. You had that person in your life for the reason, but is there that person in the life and are they playing that role? If so, again, I'm not looking for you to be perfect, but I'm looking for you when you have all this power for you to have some checks and balances. Yeah. This is one rudimentary way that it can happen. Is not happening? Yeah. Yeah. That's so important. I love that. It is. Um, well, Ben, we, w- one thing we do is towards the end of, of our show, something we call the final five, um, a little more rapid fire. I'd love to jump into that. The first, first question, uh, and, and there's unwritten rules here too. Sometimes people give more than one recommendation, so we'll allow it. Um, but one book you'd recommend to church leaders. Canoeing the mountains. Great book. Um, Great, great, great book. I actually have 10 of them on my, on my shelf. And someone's like, I've never read that. I just grab the copy and say, this is yours. <laughs> read it now. So okay. great book. All right. Can we, I've never heard of it. I'm going to go look it up. <sighs> Very Sorry. Good. So, yeah. the, the, too long did, didn't read is um, when Lewis and Clark were uh, looking for the Pacific coast and they're trying to find a waterway to get themselves there. They had canoes. Well, guess what? They ran into the Rocky Mountains, and they needed something other than canoes to get over them. Yeah. We as church leaders will oftentimes use the past generation's tools to address the current oh. generation. Are we willing to give up our tools? This was written in 2018, just before the pandemic hit. Wow. Revelatory for me in my thinking, and but yeah. beyond the pandemic, future proof as well. This will always apply. Uh, apply. How do you how do you uh, not try to come in canoe mountains? Very cool. Awesome. I wish I had mountains nearby. I don't, I don't have any mountains, but <laughs> now I want to. <laughs> All right, Ben, what is the last thing that you listened to? Spotify, Apple, whatever. Uh, I recently listened to, I don't know if this, when this is going to drop, but the NBA draft just happened. And yeah. um, I listened to all the, the, I'll geek out on that. And that's why I listened to a number of podcasts assessing and hearing how my lowly Detroit Pistons did and fared in the draft and <laughs> were perpetual Ooh. losers at the point. But at some point, it was one of these decades, we're going to turn it around. Come back, bad boys. Come back. I'm sorry. Are you a, are you a, a Detroit Lions fan as well? No, just the Pistons. Okay. Just the Pistons. Okay. That would be it's too a city. Much it's a city that's been on, oh, yeah, some hard. hard. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, what What is your favorite piece of technology? And you can't say your phone. Sorry. Okay, okay I'm not going to say my phone, but I'm going to say an app on the phone. It is we'll Movie it. Pro. Is the app? Is the app, um, I think it's written one word, Movie Pro, but it allows you to record um, what's the forward facing camera and the backward facing camera at the same time. And oh. like when I post that on social media, like. I'll, and I don't get a ton of DMs, but people are like, what, what is that app? How do you do it? It also allows you to use with an iPhone natively your earbuds to record the audio. Most people think that when if you have your earbuds on and you pull up the camera feature and you're recording a video, it's recording the audio from your earbuds. So you could be like in a windy street. It's not. It is recording the from your speaker Very unless cool. you have a third party, you know, third party app. So um, it's a great one. Movie Pro. All right. And I hope you have an affiliate code. That was a solid plug for that. <laughs> yeah, I'm trying. I'm trying to get in with them. Well, All I right. also did not know you could record front and back at the same time. So I just learned something. Yeah. It's yeah. actually really, really helpful. Thank you. It is. It's very fun. <laughs> All right, Ben, is there a quote, a piece of advice, some sound sage wisdom that has stuck with you over the years? One of the advice that my dad gave me was he said, when it comes to professions, and this is what I'm trying to give to my daughters as well, look for a profession where you can make a positive impact in the world where you can be um, adequately compensated and that you grow. So positive impact, you know, um, you're building a table. Great. Everyone needs a table. Um, should you be like um, a corrupt Wall Street trader? You know, not that they're all corrupt, uh, but like, you know, should you be making <laughs> your, your, your profits on negativity? No. Um, a- a- adequately compensated. So don't go chase money, but also, and this is probably also for more church, Christian leaders mm-hmm. listening to us as well, be adequately compensated, know what your market value is and yeah. like, and, and demand it. Um, and then the last thing, something that you grow. So God's designed all of us to glow and flourish. We are his workmanship. Mm-hmm. We are not complete done. Paul is looking for the day where he is made complete. Well, until mm-hmm. then, hopefully your job brings some of that completion to the table mm-hmm. and that you can grow and develop as a human being. Mm-hmm. That's awesome. 
All right, last one. What's one thing that you'd like to communicate to our audience of church leaders? Since we are talking to church leaders, I will alliterate because Christians love alliteration. They, but make yeah, sure that we do. <laughs> we do. It's our besitting sin. Yeah. Um, make sure that you hit the, <laughs> all the three C's when you lead people. And what I mean by that is oftentimes we'll coach people uh, and we'll critique people, but we'll for, forget to celebrate them. Or we'll celebrate mm-hmm. behind their back. We'll praise them, but not in front of their face. Mm-hmm. Um, most of us are inspired and motivated and recharged through celebration. So that for me, I'm a back. I've probably spent the front nine coaching, probably critiquing heavy. I'm trying to spend the back nine of my career c- celebrating people. You did this really well. Um, or you, you know, you, you did it pretty good. And I'm going to sell that, celebrate that. We can, uh, we got some coaching and, and, and critiquing to do, but celebrate, celebrate, celebrate what God's doing in your midst. Life is too short to not celebrate. Yeah. The, the three C's are usually color, cut and clarity. What's what's that from? I don't understand. Oh, you're a dude. It's for diamonds. Diamonds. The three C's of diamonds are color, cut, and clarity. So I'm, I'm bringing a touch of femininity to the podcast today, but yours are actually a lot better and more impactful to real life, not just jewelry. So I get, I get, ask I, any woman. As you, as you said oh, that. I'll ask my wife like, right afterwards. Ask yeah. her. As you said that, it came back. I will say... I got, I got knee deep into those when it was like engagement ring shopping, you know, yeah. years and years ago. Um, but then that information left my head, certainly. Yeah. So. I'm bringing it back, gents. You're welcome. Thank you. If you have anniversaries coming up, I will help you out. Perfect. If Perfect. you got two months of salary just sitting around, just go for it. <laughs> right. Yeah. Go for right. it. I need to be a yes. little more adequately compensated to afford that. Back. <laughs> yeah. Full uh, circle. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Ben, thank you so much for taking the time to uh, be with us uh, today. Would you do me a favor? Can you just share if people want to connect with you, follow along, maybe see um, where you might be speaking, all that stuff? How, how can they do that? You can connect with me on social, um, on most of the platforms that with Ben Stapley. I, I've squatted on that name everywhere. Whenever a new platform comes up, I jump on it right away and claim Ben Stapley. Um, or ju- um, jump on benstapley.com. It's probably, uh, probably benstapley.com slash blog. You can re- read additional thoughts that I write there. I'd love for people to check that out. Awesome. Well, we'll, we're, we'll certainly link to that as well as some of the other resources that you mentioned. Yeah. Thank you again um, for your wisdom, for coming on the show and for, um, you know, blessing and equipping our listeners. Really appreciate that and really appreciate those of you uh, listening or watching this. Uh, if it has encouraged you, helped you, if it's helpful for maybe a church leader or pastor, you know, we would love for you to share that by sending a link, uh, making a comment, subscribing, leaving a review. All of that helps get these conversations into the ears of more church leaders. So we would appreciate that. And as always, our goal is to bring conversations that help empower healthy churches. We're grateful to do that. And we plan on doing more and more. And so be on the lookout for those. And we'll see you next time. This episode of the Church Leadership Lab podcast is brought to you by Ministry Brands, the largest provider of church technology software. Over 90,000 churches rely on ministry brands for their single platform solution that brings together all the digital tools a church needs. From online giving to websites to church management software and more, Ministry Brands is leading the way in simple to use, innovative solutions, all with the goal of empowering healthy churches. To learn more, visit ministrybrands.com.